you know it so well. It's it's amazing. No one can accuse you of speaking out of ignorance. It's uh, you you put me to shame with uh, your uh, immediate knowledge of uh, anything and everything in in the New Testament as well as the Tanakh. It's amazing. Rabbi, it's great to talk with you as always. I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, you've been very busy lately, as always, I'm sure. Absolutely. These Christians keep me very busy. Absolutely. What do you think of, of Christianity is, uh, in its own right? Does it have any like real theological status or or do you consider it just a man-made religion of course as you know i i consider all of them uh that way but uh how is is it uh is it good or bad is the what do you think of these double covenant ideas for instance that christian christianity is a way of bringing uh the gentiles into the the faith of the god of israel even though it may have some uh, odd pagan admixture. I'm just curious as to what you think about it. On every level, it's malevolent. On every level, uh, it's a, a terrible influence. Is there a religion that spilt more blood, that took the lives of more innocent people than the church? Uh, the bloodiest religious war in human history, a war that probably triggered all the criticism of Christianity, uh, the Thirty Year War, sixteen eighteen to sixteen forty eight, eight million people dead. No doubt, Christianity is the author of the Holocaust. Without Christianity, the Shoah. Uh, the destruction of European Jewry during World War II would have not been possible because the it would have not been possible for the Germans to have sold the notion that Jews were untermenschen, subhuman, without the Christian Bible. You know, we, we've been on air, Bob, so many times together, and we often talk about contradictory texts in the Christian Bible where the New Testament doesn't e even agree with itself. And and I don't just mean that um, it doesn't, that the stories contradict each other. That's plain. But theologically, the books contradict each other. Um, but there is something very consistent in the Christian Bible. And, and that is it's notoriously anti-Semitic. It's portrayal and caricature the way it characterizes the Jews, just most people, thank goodness, don't read the Christian Bible because if they did, they would be, God only knows what would have happened to us. So the Christian Bible very consistently uh, has a, a villain, and that's the Jews. Uh, the, the character development is, is it's very well done. The um, the Jews at every stage are just plotting to destroy Christ, uh, starting from the infancy narrative. I don't, you know this, starting from the infancy narrative of Matthew, um, Herod is looking to kill the kid for, uh, I can't say for no reason. He, he found out the king of the Jews was born in Bethlehem. And while Herod is looking to kill the kid, you have people from the east we don't know how many they are, but these people following a star, they're just looking to to worship the, the newborn Savior and then go back to wherever they came from through a circuitous route so as not to jeopardize the kid. In every, and then going to the passion narratives, the Jews, I mean, they're all on the same page. If you Christians watching us now want to talk about consistency, all the Gospels consistently characterize the Jews as completely responsible for Jesus' death, and Pontius Pilate is nothing more than 
a lackey. There is just an, a difference of temperature. John is amped up most, the last gospel. Mark is... It's still a, a nightmare. But if, if, if John, Luke, and Matthew had never been written, it wouldn't be that bad. It's bad, but not it's, they're all bad. So on that level, it's a nightmare. And then Christianity spiritually brought idolatry to the world. It, it, it acted as a vehicle with which to transmit all the pagan mythologies uh, into Judaism and from a religious standpoint, it's a nightmare. It's true that the doctrine of the Trinity is a very late development, um, and it, was, it wasn't invented at Nicaea. It was hammered out as orthodoxy in Nicaea. But the, the notion that Jesus is divine is all over the Christian Bible. I think people miss that. He's just not the God created the universe, but he is definitely in the Carmen Christi, which is no doubt from the hand of Paul. Um, Jesus is divine. He's, div he's adopted in Mark, and he's the Logos divine in the first 18 passages of John. So for Judaism, it's not a neutral. This is not Buddhism. <laughs> Jews have never been afraid of, whoa, there's a Hindu there. Let's like, no, it's not that. It's a very, it's a terrible religion on every level for the Jewish people. You know, this reminds me somehow for the first time of what um, non-communists say about communism that well it, it sounds good in some ways but look at what ha look at the bloody history of the thing mm -hmm. and what this ostensibly good you know let's share and be equal this mm -hmm. this ostensibly good ideology look what it uh, has produced on the ground uh, in mm -hmm. in the actual history mm -hmm. and uh, it's uh, not a pretty picture and we're quick uh, to say that uh, haven't people learned the lesson of history? Why are they still attracted by uh, the uh, the propaganda for? They sure, kids sure are in America today, but we don't seem to realize the same thing is true about right. Christianity. Uh, right. It sounds good on paper, and yes, some people have done good things in its name, but they probably would have anyway because they were good people, right. but uh, look at the big picture it's kind of frightening you know you you brought up you know communism the revolution christian russia i you know robert you you right you nailed it right there because as it turns out so here we have christian russia alexander the third was a vicious anti-semite hated jews oh. he blamed the jews for the murder of alexander the second nikolai the second was that's a horrible person. And there was a thought that, well, Soviet Union would be godless after the revolution. But the Christianity is so toxic that it simply metastasized itself right into Soviet Russia, a godless Russia. That, that's what a, a canter this is. And I, you know, I, you know Bob, you know, you're a friend. We, we go back. And, I, and people might think watching us that – you who are not a Christian, I am not a Christian, maybe we're like mischaracterizing this or we're exaggerating this or I'm making this stuff up or you're overstating it because we don't have a flattering view of the Christian religion. Everything that we've said to this point is the consensus. If people studying, uh, you know, Hitler, I, I don't know what exactly what level of Christian he was, but read Mein Kampf. I had to read it a few times to write my books. It's a, it's 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 a it's a coherent book, and Jesus is spoken of very positively. Um, it, there's nothing, this is not revolutionary stuff, nothing we're saying here. And we can even take something, you know, we talked about the infancy narrative. That's mainstream, what, what I said. The, the passion narrative is a nightmare. You can even take a story as benign as John chapter 9, a story of Jesus healing a man blind from birth. If I stood here and read it to you, pick your translation, 
the, 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 the takeaway is not that Jesus healed the man. The takeaway is, look at these sick Jews who are just persecuting this man, trying to find out who healed him. He's thrown out of the synagogue. I mean, it, that's John 9. That's not John 19. Yeah. This is not, I mean, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, and I encourage, <laughs> if you think that Bob or I are, Maybe we just have a, we're just anti-Christian. No, just just read it for yourself. The takeaway in John nine is a story about how evil the Jews are and how they sought to conspire against Christ for just healing a fellow born blind, and and that's the and everywhere in the New Testament, that's the story. It's the it's in Paul, it's the Sermon of the Mount. Jesus is excoriating the Jews in the Sermon on the Mount. He is criticizing Gentiles, but look at the difference. The criticism of the Jew is much more visceral. It it's really is all over the place. Yeah, even such a thing as the sentimentally cherished nativity story, when you sit back and say, wait a second, the angel tells Joseph, you better take that kid and get out of town because Herod is uh, on the warpath. That doesn't stop all the other kids in Bethlehem for get, from getting uh, killed, right? Why didn't the angel get on the loudspeaker and say to everybody, get the hell out of here? Right. No, no, we don't really care about them. It's just uh, the kid Jesus. <laughs> I I don't know how I missed that for years, but uh, I guess I was drawn in by the the point of the story. It is Jesus centric, but you can't just isolate that. And it's right. just you know, the rest of them they're just kindling for the fire. Uh, it's uh, unbelievable. The, the antagonist in the Christian Bible is very well developed. It's so well written that people miss this. Scholars miss this. The protagonist is so well developed. Look at whether, you know, Matthew and Luke in the infancy narrative are far more contradictory than any other part of the Christian Bible. I mean, as, as much as you and I could sit here and talk about the differences in the passion narrative, the infancy narratives are off the charts. Even evangelical Christian apologists have a lot of trouble with this, and some of them will concede that they're unreconcilable. But, I mean, they're just, they're just totally different. The passion narratives seem consistent compared to the infancy narrative. We're talking about Matthew, Luke. Uh, but, but look at the difference of the attitude of the Jews, Herod seeking to kill the children of Matthew 2, 13 through 15, whereas the, the Magi from, I presumably from Persia are worshiping the kid, bringing gifts for the kid. What a contrast, the Jews, and not just the Jews, the representative of the Jews, Herod, is seeking to kill the kid, while these Gentiles, while simple, are worshiping the child and seeking to save the child. The New Testament is so contradictory. It doesn't care if Paul in Romans 3 says that all men are sinful, famously. It doesn't even care if Luke says in chapter 1, verse 6, that the Zachariah and Elizabeth were sinless. Those are not, they're not compatible with each other. They don't, they don't care. But the one thing that is from Matthew through the book of Revelation, where the Jews are not the real Jews and the synagogue is a synagogue of Satan, both in Revelation 2 and 3, it's beginning to end just a screed against the Jews. And the anti-Semitism we see pop up in other religions, all borrowed from Christianity. How about the, the famous passage where Jesus says, uh, the, the centurion says, could you come and heal my servant? I, I know mm. you can do it. I give orders. I know you, you can give orders to demons and they'll obey you. So how about it? And Jesus says, look at this. I've never found faith like this in Israel. Right. <laughs> uh, I mean, is that just saying, wow, here's a believing Gentile. Well, it is saying that, but uh, let's not uh, ignore the rest of it. The point right. is to say, yeah, there, there's no believers here. Uh, we got to go beyond the bounds of Israel to find one. Right. And then, 
(laughs) Then he says, you know, you're going to be pretty surprised on Judgment Day when you say uh, you're you're waiting in line to get into the Messianic banquet and hear all these unwashed heathen coming in to share the banqueting board with Mm -hmm. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and you guys don't get an invitation. Boy, are you going to be upset at that. (laughs) Just gloating. And, And it's total supersessionism. Uh, it's uh, it, the only people that uh, I have to hand it to the dispensationalists. They at least, uh, though they're fundamentalists as the day is long, they say, wait a minute here. Uh, the God still has a, a plan of glory for Jews. At least that. Uh, but uh, some of them. Oh no! They uh, and and oddly enough, it's the the worst in my opinion, or the uh, liberal Protestants who tend to side with the PLO, uh, mm. and uh, <laughs> it's right. I can see how they get there by their manner of thinking that everything is politics and all politics to be good have to be left wing, but that doesn't mean they haven't gone off in the wrong direction. It's just mm. ironic where they wind up. Uh, right. still uh, hating uh, Jews and Israel. Right, right. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll share this with you. We, we haven't talked about this before, but I'll just say this. I, my sen- my, I feel always that the book of Mark is most elegant. And what I mean is it's, it's less enhanced than the other Gospels. And it, it, it really is, if you take out the last 12 verses that appear in the King James, it, it has a. It, it's really very coherent in what it's doing, and this goes to the heart of what you just said. Mark is very striking, and the problem with Mark is that every person on this planet who reads Mark has read Matthew already, so it colors it completely. But Mark begins with the mystery for eight chapters. I mean, that's what's very striking. Nobody knows who Jesus is, and if anybody figures it out, it's a secret, right? And then Mark really ends with the centurion who says, ah, at the cross, saying, behold, this is the Son of God. And people wonder, like, how does Mark end the way it ends with the women saying nothing to anyone? It's brilliant, because it, it starts with, it's the grand secret and the Jews don't get it at all, but who does get it? The centurion. And for the viewers who don't know, the centurion was not just a soldier or a high-level soldier. He represented the empire. He had servants below him. So the, the Rome gets it, and the Jews are blind. That's the, I mean, it's such a consistent book if you take, you know, not the 679 passages, but move those last 12 it really, that's the whole mark, is the Jews are blind, and it's the same story in the prologue of John, John 1, verse 11. He came to his own, but they received him not. Bingo. That, that's it, right there. That He came to his own. A prophet is not without honor except from his own countrymen. Bingo. That's it. The Jews rejected him. And that's why Paul, in I think you'll agree that First Thessalonians is a candidate for being the earliest surviving Christian literature. It very likely is. Um, Paul goes off on the Jews in the second chapter. And that's it. So it's a nightmare for the Jews. This is not just like Buddhism. This is not uh, the Pali canon of Buddhism or the Bhagavad Gita. There's nothing remotely resembling this. And that's why during the World War II, as the Christians, as the Europeans was slaughtering the Jews, the Chinese and the Japanese were saving Jewish people. I mean, how did that happen? It's not Europeans are not genetically messed up. It's just their minds were poisoned with this Christological literature and portrayal. Yeah. Right, right. Yes. And there's, there's yeah. Not... Uh, the, the, yeah, there's no way to challenge that. And, and right. uh, attempts to do so are just grotesque right. uh, text twisting. Uh, and I'd like, I, I will grant that the heat uh, of this hatred in the Gospels must stem from strife between the two religious communities, but that doesn't really mitigate anything. I mean, you can you can sort of explain how hatred grows uh, as people fail to live up to their uh, the uh, turn the other cheek sort of uh, uh, 
uh, ethic, but that does, what do you expect? The uh, persecution, we don't really know who persecuted whom. The, 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 uh, a lot of those stories seem to be a lot of bunk anyway, but it, it doesn't matter if you can explain where the hatred comes from. It's right. hatred. I mean, Christianity was not on board with the gods of the Roman Empire, right? That it wasn't on board with the with the beliefs of the of the people of the empire, the gods of the empire, the gods that Julian the apostate came to embrace when he reverted back. Uh, but that's benign, and the empire was installed by God. Their authority is from God, and according to Paul, if you rebel against the authorities, you're rebelling against God. I mean, there's a, people watching this think we're making this up. We're not. Yeah, doesn't it? I, I, I am uh, interested in the uh, Dutch radical approach to the epistles and the gospels, where they're looking for signs of anachronism that maybe these things weren't that early. And I've never really thought of this point before, but like you say, the, the incredible irony of Paul saying, yeah, you can trust the Roman government because God appointed them. He appointed these polytheistic people that worship Zeus and so forth. Is it I mean, it almost makes me wonder, does this not pr presuppose a uh, Christian Rome? I, I guess it doesn't, but it just seems so odd. It would uh, almost, that it even looks like that. Uh, you really got to be sold out to the Romans to, uh, right. to, to even say such a thing, but... You know, if this was just a weird statement in Romans 13, that would be one thing. But we find the same theme in 1 Peter 2, and we find it all over the Gospels. If Rome is off the hook, Pontius Pilate is exonerated. Pontius Pilate opposes the crucifixion of Jesus, and he thinks that mm. Barabbas should be the one to be crucified, and the Jews will have no part of it. Mm. Pontius Pilate's wife, who makes a cameo in Matthew's, 27 she's had jesus in a dream i mean for those who don't know i think people don't read the christian bible it's very pro-roman whatever render what is to caesar what caesar's it, it will have no part of being critical of the empire i mean you have in the beginning of it, this differs sharply from acts in acts people who are pagans in paul's view in ways portraying act, they just don't know any better, uh, and that's why they're worshiping the wrong god. And Romans one, because he's speaking to a different audience, well, he's more harsh on the idolatry. But the authority is totally, um, the authority is definitely from God. Don't rebel against it, and that's why Pontius Pilate is off the hook completely. He, at every stage, they're off the hook. This thing about uh, the in Acts 17 with Paul before the Areopagus, when he says, I happen to notice this idol said dedicated to an unknown God. Well, we know there there was such a thing, but it said unknown gods. And the idea was uh, we don't want to accidentally neglect some God who's escaped our notice because maybe they could start making trouble for us to get some attention. Well, he says, I'm going to proclaim this God to you. And, and it's the, uh, the, uh, the Christian God. Is he saying that uh, you are already worshiping our God? You just don't know it? Because that's, in a sense, a way of getting the pagans off the hook and bringing them closer. Whereas the rest of the story has Jews fanatically uh, pursuing Paul and uh, stoning him and so on and so on. They hear he's in another city and say, let's go get him. Uh, and it's what a contrast. Not mm -hmm. only do the Romans keep exonerating him, boy, it's a shame this guy appealed to Caesar because now we're going to have to uh, remand him to Caesar. He, he could have gotten away uh, scot-free. Uh, so it's almost his, his own fault, but of course it's uh, an attempt to witness to uh, uh, the emperor if he ever got that far. But mm -hmm. the, uh, the, like Luke and Acts, 
are, are really apologias for uh, Romans and well Gentiles, but Romans in particular, right. that may be apologetics in the sense of, hey, hey, don't persecute us. We're really on your side. Right. But I don't think that changes it there. Yeah. It is like, let's, how about the parable of the uh, wicked tenants? Where uh, God is uh, going to, he's the landlord, and he's going to say, okay, you uh, you Jewish authorities, you're, you're not giving me what I want, namely worship and righteousness, so to hell with you, I'll find a different nation right. uh, to, to take over. You mean the Romans are going to be the rightful owners of, of the Holy Land now? Well, right. that's, that's already happened with uh, Luke by the time he says this. And uh, it, it's really... <laughs> pretty disturbing paul was um very temperamental and that's just you see that in his letters he he's a person who is constantly throwing a tantrum i mean that that is very distinct from the book of hebrews forgetting about the language of hebrews it's a higher greek but hebrews is very systematic he's not temperamental very systematically it is a a complete 13 chapters are just an argument against Judaism. But he, whoever wrote it is n not losing his temper. Paul is constantly exaggerating how much he's being persecuted. I find it interesting at the end of the book of Acts where he basically, he's not at the Holiday Inn when he's in prison for a couple of years in Rome. <laughs> he, I'm not, I don't want to overstate it, but he is in a rented room you know, he's, he's, he's in, you know, guests are coming to visit. This is how the book of Acts ends. You know, this is why to me it's so insane to believe that Paul was killed by Nero in the 60s. He, I, in my view, he almost certainly went off to Spain. And that seems to be um, vindicated by Clement's uh, letter, his epistle, um, that he was, he, Paul went off and per died, you can infer from, first Clement to the people of Corinth that he died in the westernmost part. That would that would definitely be Spain. Yep, uh, Paul yeah. had it but you know, you notice the language of the last handful of verses in Acts um, twenty eight, and that is Paul is in a rented room, that's prison, and he's <laughs> inviting guests. Jews are just coming to visit him and some of them believe, some of them don't. But then Paul goes on, but I'm in chains. He has a Roman guard in front of his rented flat, <laughs> in front of his bachelor pad. I'm not kidding, just reading it, it's right there. So, um, you know, I, I think Paul, I think it's true what he says at the end of Romans and things 16, where he says that he just, Ro Rome was a stopping off point for him on his way to Spain. Mm -hmm. And that's where he likely died. It's hard to say with certainty, but that's what seems to be the case. But his ongoing, the Jews, are, the Jews had bigger problems than Paul and Jesus. They had the empire to deal with. They didn't, that, that there are Christians in Damascus that were, they had to be persecuted and Paul is sent by the high priest. Why? Like the high priest had nothing to worry about, but a bunch of hippie Jews believing that Jesus is the Messiah and somehow they had authority over uh, over Christ, new Christians in Damascus. It's all very silly stuff. Yeah, that's right. Uh, would Paul, uh, would the, the Sanhedrin have had any authority to yeah. send him as a bounty hunter almost? Uh, it, it doesn't look like it. Uh, and uh, uh, there, there are other problems too. Was Paul really a Roman citizen? That never comes up in any of the epistles. Mm. Uh, it uh, just uh, it it's looks like it's designed to uh, embarrass the uh, the opponents of Paul. Uh, as mm. soon as he mentions that, they say, "Oh, wait a minute! We can't persecute this guy or mm. any other Christians uh, known to the readers." Uh, uh, and it, it is uh, very well told, and there's even. Uh, good humor elements in the book of Acts that uh, I think it's it's the funniest book of the uh, the New Testament like where Peter is on death row and his pious followers are down the street uh, praying all night for him 
their prayers are answered. The angel comes and sets them free. He goes back to where they're gathered and says, mm -hmm. hey, it's me. And the, the maid is so shocked. She doesn't even open the door. She goes mm -hmm. in and says, it's Peter. And I think, you're yeah, crazy. It must be his angel, his, his mm -hmm. ghost, basically. And, and this is so hilarious because it says, here are these pious people praying all night for Peter, mm -hmm. but it doesn't even occur to them that God might have answered their prayers. Mm -hmm. uh, that That's uh, pretty good stuff, I think. But uh, still, the, uh, the idea is that who was putting Peter uh, in the noose, if he could, uh, it wasn't the Romans, it was Herod Agrippa. And, mm. uh, oh right. boy, fascinating stuff, though. A lot of it's and, reprehensible. And, right, uh, right. He, he gets out. And... What do you make of uh, ecumenical efforts between Jews and Christians? Uh, what do you think they're really trying to, to do, to understand one another better or to come up with theological compromises or... Which, like, uh, for instance, some, uh, uh, I forget the guy's name, but one theologian said that uh, maybe Jews could view Jesus not as a false messiah, but as a failed messiah, like Bar Kokhba, so that perhaps uh, if he, he was or maybe a rebel against Rome and was killed for it, well, that counts for something. He wasn't just a deceiver of Israel. Uh, th there, There's this attempt to get along by saying, Here's the best we can say about your guy. Isn't that enough? Yeah, I mean, the liberal Episcopalians see Jesus as, you know, something a little bit more than, you know, Dr. King fighting for civil rights or something like that. So it depends who, you know, it could be liberal Catholics. I remember a number of years ago, it was the craziest story in the world, The uh, a professor at an Israeli university whose father was the chief rabbi of Rome, name is Toaf, wrote a crazy book that perhaps the Jews did um, engage in drinking, uh, using blood in the matzah. It was the most insane story. You may have missed it, but in Israel, it was the biggest story in the world. And it was Catholic scholars that came out you know, condemning it. So, you you know the the, the so you have Christian scholar Christianity is such a highly variegated religion. No doubt. I mean, I'll be speaking in Germany next month. You know, they're filled with guilt, and if they could come up with the idea that Jesus was just a a great rabbi, a, a, you know, the kind of flucer thinking, well, that that's fine. And then liberal Jews say, yeah, he was. A, that's fine. You know. You know, of course, they can find a lot of a lot of common ground. Where the common ground is not achievable is among people who are devout Christians. So they believe the New Testament is the Word of God. They're they're not going to compromise on these issues. Mm -hmm. They might. You spoke earlier about the dispensationalists, the followers of John Nelson Darby, the 19th century mm -hmm. theologian who thought that replacement theology was a night was the worst mistake the church had ever made so th they could dispensationalists can unify with religious jews not over jesus but over um that the jews are have never been replaced and that the covenant that god made with the jews has never been eviscerated as all other Christians believe, as the Catholic Church believes, they're all replacement theology, the Eastern Orthodox Church, completely replacement theology. So that they can they really can and do unify on and that God is still working with Israel. And that if not for people like Cyrus Gofield and Moody, it would have never taken off. But you had these people who spread it uh, throughout the United States, which was highly, I think, um, v just very happy to have uh, to find something special in the Jew. It, it's an American thing because it was so anti the Church of England that that was that spread like wildfire. So there, you can have agreement on the Zionism for sure, but not on the on the theology was Jesus. Um, was, was Jesus the Messiah or anything positive? There is a text by Maimonides, perhaps the greatest Jewish thinker 
the Jews think a lot, but he's up there. And Maimonides says that Christianity is there really to prepare the world for the Messiah. Not that it's a positive thing. He was very critical of Christianity, but thought that if the world were Christian, that would explain how in Messianic prophecies, the Gentiles immediately recognize their error, and Christians, while not comfortable with this question, if pressed, would concede that if they're wrong about Jesus, if Jesus is not the Messiah, so Christians would have to say then the default baseline is Pharisaic or Orthodox Judaism because that's what it would fall back to. If, if their faith is in vain, well, then it defaults back to not Sadducee Judaism, but Pharisaic Judaism. So that's the thinking. People misunderstand what Maimonides is saying. But um, so they, they're ca- uh, among the liberal camps, everything is possible because they're, they will compromise on any of these theological issues. Well, I remember, wasn't it Rabbi Akiva who uh, was on record saying that Bar Kokhba was the Messiah? And right. when it uh, didn't pan out, they didn't consider Akiva some sort of apostate or heretic. He maintained his uh, due reputation as a great sage of Israel. That's always made me wonder how Jewish Christians, or if that's so, not an oxymoron, uh, in the beginning, if they believed Jesus was the Messiah, did they necessarily think Jews who didn't believe that were uh, going to be in trouble uh, at the final judgment? It seems to me not necessarily. We might be imposing much later Christian views on them. Right. Uh, so, you know, anyway, um, I'll tell you a, cra- a funny story. Many years ago, maybe 30 years ago, I was in Dallas and I met up with a Christian leader, very well known guy. And he In our conversation, he said, look, Rabbi Akiva, he was perhaps one of the greatest rabbis that ever lived. He was a Tano. He lived in the second century. It means he was an author of the Mishnah. He was way up there. He said, Rabbi Akiva was wrong about Bakachba, the revolutionary who from 132 to 135 had a, for the time being, a successful revolution. Ultimately, he was killed by the empire. The whole thing was crushed. So he said to me, I'll never forget this. He said, isn't it obvious that your greatest rabbi was wrong about the Messiah? Okay. And I turned to him and I asked him, tell me this. How do you know that Bar wasn't the Messiah? And he looked at me like I had lost my mind. He said, what are you talking about? But Kahu was killed by the Romans, and he filled no messianic prophecies. And I just stared at him. And then he, he got what he had said. He dismissed, I, I just simply asked him, how do you know Bakahba isn't the Messiah? His reply was, Bakahba was killed by the Romans without fulfilling any messianic <laughs> prophecy. I said, Hello, that's exactly what you believe in. I mean, it's mind blowing, and 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 then he he really got it. So here's the point: I'm not trying to be cute. As long as Bar Kokhba was in a movement and he retook Jerusalem, it didn't last for many years, but it lasted for a few years. It was a a revolution that occurred some 60 years after the destruction of the Second Temple. As long as Bar Kokhba was alive then he could potentially be the Messiah, and it was not heretical. Mm-hmm. The moment Bar Kocha was killed by the Romans, it then became heresy to believe that he is the Messiah, and that's the whole point. So, right, Rabbi Kiva was a great rabbi who thought, maybe this person is the Messiah. Maybe. Why? Because he's doing what the Messiah is supposed to do. I mean, read the text. He's, he's supposed to destroy the enemies of God namely the empire. So while he was successfully doing that, he could have been. He really, it was not heretical things as the Messiah. It becomes heretical the moment you say after he's killed by the Romans without accomplishing his that, then you have just left Judaism. That's, so Rabbi Kiva is the perfect 
point to demonstrate exactly why Christianity is a false religion. Rabbi Kiva was very consistent. Oh, you're killed? Then you can't be the Messiah. Let's move on. So absolutely, mm-hmm. while he was alive, well, while uh, no one knows whatever Jesus was doing because we have no writing of his. You know, we... You know, we don't, we don't, have n- you know, people, when they say Jesus really, the real Jesus, they're just um, saying, you know, they're using verisimilitude of what we think an Orthodox Jew, from, but nobody knows, you know, you can extract from the right. Gospels, but the Gospels are so, so much myth, so much later, so, Paul never met, it. it's just, it, you could, do all you want to. You can It's it's a game. It's not real science when people say Jesus was this or Jesus was that. You know. Um, you know there were um, there were you know Christian Christian. Thing. You know, as Albert Schweitzer's ideas seem to hold sway today, but no one can. It doesn't. We don't know. But the key is, once he's dead, he can't possibly be the Messiah. That's the point, and that was the point of Rabbi Akiva. As long as Bakaho was alive, sure, that's not heretical. It is heretical once he's dead. I love that passage in Isaiah, I believe also in Micah, uh, practically verbatim, when it says that uh, the day will come when the nations will uh, stream uh, up to Mount Zion to be taught the Torah. And Mm -hmm. when I I try to explain that in classes, or I did, I would say it's like, Everybody says, "Okay, look, uh, the 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 Messiah has come. Uh, uh, God has redeemed Israel. I guess we know who was right now. So uh, let's uh, let's go and get right. the education we should have had long ago." Uh, I think that that's somehow a unique uh, scenario that really explains a lot. Let's talk. Let's talk, Bob. Let's talk, not Bob, but. Dr. Price, and I'll tell you why I say that, because you're a New Testament scholar. Here we have the most ecstatic messianic prophecy, arguably in the entire Hebrew Bible, so famous that Isaiah 2 is not only quoted in Micah, but it appears in front of the United Nations on First Avenue, engraved on the wall. The UN, and I can't stand the UN, I'm not a fan, but they had the brains to create an Isaiah wall. And as it turns out, the, the most numinous messianic prophecy, arguably, in all the Hebrew Bible is quoted nowhere in the New Testament. Isaiah 2 is never quoted in the Christian Bible. Not once. Really? Not once? How is that possible? So, ki mitziyayim teitzei Torah udvar Hashem Yishlayim. Ah, Beautiful words. Out of Zion will go forth the Torah and the word of God from Jerusalem. No Eucharist, no none of this. Just pure. It's going to return. And we're Jerusalem. And what's Jerusalem? Jerusalem is a city that where I live has no natural resources. It's it's a, it's a tiny place. It's, there's no even ocean front. And and look at that. The New Testament never quotes it. Why do you think that is? Because Jesus didn't do it. It's uh, like, you know, the Christian Bible has a knack for quoting things that have nothing at all to do with why they're being quoted. That they quote, you know. But Isaiah 2, it, you, know, you know, even you, know, you take books like the book of Jonah. So the, book of jo- the point of the book of Jonah is that here is the worst people in the world, the capital of Assyria. They repent and God forgives them. I mean, that's the whole point. And Jonah is bewildered at the end. It's a beautiful story. Here you have a book that's devoted to sin and atonement, we are told, the New Testament. And although the book of Jonah is quoted, for every reason in the world, that Jesus is going to be, Matthew 12, going to be in the in the tomb for like Jonah was in the whale. It's a sign of the whale. Uh, same chapter, Jesus saying that the people of Nineveh testify against you in this arrogant thing. You have someone um, with you who's greater than Jonah. But you don't mention that God will forgive you if you repent. 
hello, and that's the Christian Bible. Like, how did you miss that? Fine. Do you want to say Jonah was in the belly of a whale for three days and three nights, the fish? Whatever. Fine. He wasn't three days and three nights. Even, But let's just, I don't want to be pedantic. But you can't mention that God had mercy on people that, and this is a book that is putatively about sin and atonement. That's the whole Christian Bible. And that you didn't think was important enough? That's how, that's how damaged the Christian yeah. Bible is. And it goes back to your first question. This is not just a mistaken book. It's not the Bhagavad Gita and all the Hindus, nothing personal. But it's not that. This is an, an evil book that did so much damage to the world. You know it so well. It's it's amazing. No one can accuse you of speaking out of ignorance. It's uh, you you putting me to shame with uh, your uh, immediate knowledge of uh, anything and everything in in the New Testament as well as the Tanakh. It's amazing. You know, one of the things, and I know you'll agree with me. One of the things about the Christian Bible is it's not. It's not difficult to understand, with the exception of the book of Revelation, which is just extremely incoherent. Um, it's easy to read. It's very obvious what's happening here. You know, it, it's, it's very obvious what they're trying to do in every story. So, yeah, I mean, but it has to like, be slapped in the face. Like, Isaiah, you mentioned this. We didn't prep for this show we're doing together, right? We didn't sit and say, okay, well, this is just... Off the cuff, nowhere is Isaiah, not one passage in Isaiah 2, not one passage that they'll take their swords and spears, turn to plowshares and pruning hooks, nation not lift up sword against nation. These are like epic passages, epic, not in the Christian Bible, a book that putatively is about the Messiah and sin and atonement, and it didn't make it in. It didn't make it in. It didn't make it in because he didn't do any of those things. It's mind-blowing, yeah, but it's it's very easy to see. I think most people just don't – I don't know what's going on. I really don't. I am thankful that Christians don't read their New Testament very well because if they did, they'd hate us more. Oof. And I'm, I think that – it did. it is. I don't know. I don't – I tell you this. I really don't know how my f family in Europe – how do they survive – you know, before the how do they live in Christian Europe? Now, thankfully, they were in Catholic countries where people really didn't study their Bible. It was highly liturgical services in Europe. So maybe they just read what the, but I don't know how the Jews ever made it. I don't know how they ever survived Christian Europe. I have no idea because the books are so toxic in the way they vilified the Jews. It, it, it is shocking. It's very clear what's going on. The scam is very obvious. It's, it's unfortunate. And my, I tip my hat to the Christians who genuinely uh, like us. I don't know how they do it. <laughs> it's just mind-blowing. Do you make any attempt to um, persuade Jews who have converted to Christianity to rethink it and come back? The reason I did this, started doing this more than 40 years ago, is because there were Jews who were converted to Christianity, to evangelical Christianity, and I wanted them to return back to their faith. Mm -hmm. And that's why I began to study Christian literature mm -hmm. and then explain to them. Christianity makes it very easy because it's so falsifiable. <laughs> It makes these outrageous claims that are so easy to, dis to falsify because Christians believe that the Hebrew Bible is the Word of God, so it's very easy to do. That was the point of it. As a youngster, I didn't like non-Jews because I just grew up around anti-Semitism in Brooklyn. Survivors were everywhere around me, survivors of the Holocaust, people with numbers on their arms. That was ubiquitous. I knew the Christians did it to us, so I had no interest at all in uh, in affecting non-Jews because I, I thought they were all insane, frankly, as a youngster. But then what happened is that, you know, I began to do public speaking and lecturing and then writing and doing this. And, of course, a lot of non-Jewish Christians study what I do. And, and then 
embrace Judaism either as Noahides or converting, but my interest always was to say, to bring Jews who had become Christians to help them return back to the Jewish faith, always. That was always the goal. Have you had much success in it? I, I suspect so, but I don't happen to know. Yeah, hmm. it's, it's a lot. It's huge numbers. I never could have imagined it, but the the numbers of people Jews in the church that have returned back to their faith is, I just don't know the numbers. It's, it's very large. And an even larger number of people, which I never intended, are evangelical Christians who are turning to Judaism either as Noahides, which means that they believe in the Jewish faith and keep the seven universal Noahide laws, or converting to Jews. The numbers are so large Bob, I can't even wrap my head around mm. it, but it's enormous. You can't, in Israel today, it's very difficult to get into a conversion program. They're just packed, and it's almost exclusively former evangelicals. It's, it's just, you, you really can't get in. You have to make special application to get into a conversion program. They're packed. You can't get in, and there are very few former Buddhists or Hindus it's really almost almost all former Christians. So the impact is enormous. The, the When the church targeted the Jews for conversion, th what they did was they triggered an enormous curiosity among Christians about Jews and Judaism. And especially with dispensationalism that r definitely engendered a... I'll call it philo-Semitism for the moment mm -hmm. among evangelicals. It's not the right word I'm looking for, but certainly in admiration for Judaism mm -hmm. and the Jews as being still chosen. Um, so it, it triggered this curiosity among Christians to learn more about Judaism. I mean, today, the biggest thing you can do in a church is like introduce Hebrew. They love that. Anything Jewish is the, that's the hottest thing right now. Wow. You want to double and quadruple your membership, just bring in anything Jewish. That's, mm. it, it's even um, infiltrated American culture where you, I don't really watch TV, I don't have one, but you can see what's going on, that there's so many TV shows where the major characters are Jews. Mm. So, it's just everywhere. And as you know and I know, you know, going back to the 60s, it wasn't the Jewish character in I Love Lucy or Father. It just wasn't there. Now it's every, that's it. So it's very intriguing. And this is having an enormous impact on Christians who are taking really an, a very striking look at the Jewish faith. And I'm, I'm more than happy to accommodate them, you know, broadcasting and joining you and other shows and doing that. I want them to understand this. Um, I, that's great. I mean, uh, I uh, I don't have any special antipathy toward uh, Christianity per se, though I recognize the you know the the terrible record uh, of it. But I, I'm glad to see Judaism prospering, especially since it it's it stems from a better understanding and appreciation of Judaism. I, I just wrote something the other day where I described myself as philo-Semitic. Uh, and uh, I, I just think it, it's so attractive in many ways that I'm glad to see people understanding it, not as something alien uh, and, oh, what, not Christian? No, what's the matter with them? But rather uh, seeing uh, what there is, and which is, is loads of stuff that is so... Uh, uh, charming and and admirable, and so I'm I'm glad to see them getting uh, Jews and Judaism right. getting the the uh, the reception they deserve this right. way. And you're doing a great thing, that's for sure. And I think, well, thank you, Bob. You know, I think also that people are so uh, they discover that there's so many embellishments in doctrine in the church. I mean, just constantly evolving. That's why there's splitting and splitting. And people know that, you know, whether it's something as mundane as, you know, Christmas or the Doctrine Trinity, people are just, because there's so much information that's accessible, Christians are just discovering that there's so much embellishment, you know, even from moving the Sabbath 
from Saturday to Sunday. That's not in the Christian Bible. You know, that's really Ignatius, essentially the first of the church fathers. So that's in the early second century. So the Christians are picking this up. And, and what's happening, I think, I've never said this publicly, but I'll, I'll say it with you, and I think you'll appreciate this. So, so people are hungry for something that's original, that goes back to the, that, that's early, something, they want something authentic. Now, no matter what you believe about faith in God, whether a person is, you know, agnostic or, but people understand that no matter what you think, there's, if you believe there might be God, you can't be sure, it's very clear it's hard to assign numbers to this, but something I think about a lot in that Christianity is a spinoff from Judaism, right? So it requires just an additional hypothesis. And whenever you add another hypothesis, it just has to be less likely. It just is. Let, let me say it in a way that I think the Christian viewers will understand this. It is clear that Mormonism, meaning the Church of the Latter-day Saints, which is a spinoff of, just say, American Christianity, has to be less likely than Christianity is. And Christianity has to be less likely than Judaism is. It just has to be, because it it's Occam's razor. It just requires another hypothesis. You understand? So people, I think, are getting that when they see the development of of millenarian groups in the late 19th century that all explored whether, you know, all these groups in this church, uh, the uh, Seventh-day event, all these groups that just spun around. So people are going, well, let's try to get back to the original. I think the, the, with the craziness in the Roman Catholic Church, that's having an enormous impact on people, both Catholic and Protestant. So that's why I think Judaism is going, well, this is older. I mean, if there is a God, you know, you know the, the, the Jews have been around for a long time, and all these other religions are base are predicating themselves on it. I think that's having a big impact on people, and people who struggle with faith have to think this through. That just every time you add another hypothesis, as in Christianity and then the Roman Catholic Church, and and then the Church of the Latter Day Saints. It just becomes that much more unlikely. It has to be more unlikely. So I think people are going. I need to get back to where did this thing start? Oh, you mean in the Christian Bible it says that uh, the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses, mm -hmm. and the oracles of God were given to the Jews in Romans 3, the chapter we talked about, a very hostile chapter, a very hostile book. Matthew 23 is a it's very anti-Jewish. It's a horrible book. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a grotesque Q source. Grotesque, uh, just grotesque. And it's more. It's even more than Luke's version of it. Just I think it's Luke eleven and Matthew twenty-three. Um, it's just horrible. But Matthew twenty-three begins by saying that look, make no mistake about it. The Pharisees, which are Orthodox Jews, sit in the seat of Moses and they. And whatever they tell you, follow. They're hypocrites, the vipers, the worst people in the world. But what they're telling you is from God. Yeah, that is well, that's really a hostile revealing. Witness. So that's for, for, right. I mean, and, and, and when Jesus encounters a Samaritan, not that I believe that happened right. or Jesus, but the story in John 4 of Jesus encountering the Samaritan woman where he says, look, salvation is of the Jews. Context is your fathers, the Samaritans, they don't know what they're talking about. Forget Griezmann in the North. The Jews got it right. It's Jerusalem. So when it comes into content, unless your uh, righteousness exceeds the Pharisees, then you can't enter. Not the Sadducees, not the Samaritans. So the New Testament doesn't dare question the Pharisaic um, authority, which was the gold standard. People miss this. And, and Paul proudly, I don't believe he was a Pharisee, but he certainly knows that by saying you're a Pharisee or we're a Pharisee, Pharisee, that was that would give you the greatest credibility. Um, so and people miss that part. But that's very well baked into the Christian Bible. Pharisaic Judaism in terms of content is directly from God, don't question. And Jesus himself and Paul and all us all came from a Pharisaic background. So that's very clear in the Christian Bible. In fact, uh, one of the 
puzzling things, and maybe it's not a puzzle, maybe it's just libel. Uh, the in the debates shown between Jesus and the scribes and Pharisees, from what we know, uh, what's attested in rabbinic sources, Jesus is shown giving the uh, Pharisees like the Corban thing, uh, or the uh, the Sabbath is yes. delivered to you, uh, not you to the Sabbath. He's he's taken the Pharisaic line. <laughs> It shows the apparently the ignorance of the uh, gospel writers. You know, Bob, I don't think that our viewers right now understand the enormity, the magnitude of what you have just said. So I, I want to tr translate that because only scholars will understand what you just said. Jesus is essentially trying to, seeking to out-rabbi the rabbis using rabbinic Judaism, meaning oral traditions. In um, I, just the example you gave, the end of Mark chapter 2, uh, where Jesus is explaining why are the disciples eating, uh, plucking uh, wheat on the Sabbath when that's a forbidden act. And he gives the example from David who was hungry and therefore, uh, to save a life, you can violate the Sabbath. That's only oral tradition. I'll go crazier on you. John chapter 7. John is such an intriguing—it's not in a good way, but John is such a mixed-up book because you have this high Christology and then this low subordinate. But in John 7, Jesus is making a point about healing someone on the Sabbath. And he says, look, are you allowed to perform circumcision on a baby boy if it's on the Sabbath, because the eighth day. So if you're born on Saturday, the eighth day is Saturday. And the answer is yes. That's an oral tradition. Everything there is an oral tradition. And Jesus then uses the form of logic that if you can heal a small part of a body, then how much more so an entire body? What is the predicate? What is the basis right. for that argument? It's completely Talmudic, although Talmud hadn't been written yet. I have a whole chapter on this. There really is a, an oral prohibition of causing a bloodletting wound on the Sabbath. There is, however, a dispensation that it's for circumcision you're allowed to. That's all oral Torah. So Jesus, we're told in John 7, is saying that if you're able to perform circumcision on the Sabbath, Without oral law, that, that what is he what is he predicating on? So how much more so could you heal someone on the Sabbath? That is all predicated on the oral Torah of the Jews. People don't realize that, but everywhere Jesus is being named at his circumcision in Luke on the at on the eighth day. That's oral tradition. That's not in the Bible at all. So that's another thing. You cannot understand the New Testament fully unless you understand the oral law and the Talmud of the rabbis. The whole idea that Jesus was, that Protestants used to say that Jesus was overthrowing the Torah uh, or, or superseding it. <laughs> it the the uh, In one one book I really love is uh, um, uh, Schachter's uh, Some Aspects of Rabbinic Theology. And he points out how the very Examples Jesus gives of vows and uh, uh, and uh, adultery and and lust and uh, rage and murder and all that. He says these things right. are classic instances of building a fence right. around the Torah. He's not negating it. Uh, he's protecting the commandments. If you take this special trouble, you're not going to get in breaking distance of the commandments. And, right. and so he's not right. overturning it. Uh, and, and it should be so obvious. It's Jesus saying, oh, yeah, uh, you've heard it said you shall not um, break your vows. Well, I say go ahead and break them. I mean, that would be nullifying it, but that's, that's not what, he, not said, what right? he says. He says, look, it should become a moot point. Uh, you've, you're known to be honest. That'll be enough. So right. be honest. Uh, it's it's amazing what is not understood. We, we know that the truth is, you, if you're using the Christian Bible, you can prove anything. So if you want to be antinomian, like Paul, means against ritual law, you have loads of texts to pick from. You, you know, if you want to yeah. talk about, you have Colossians two sixteen and seventeen. Let no one tell you about the food you eat, what you drink, and 
the festivals and the high holidays. And, and in case you think, people go, oh, Paul was speaking to Gentiles. They don't have to keep these laws. It's not correct. Paul says that these things, the reason why you don't have to keep them, is very specific because these laws are all a shadow and the essence is Christ. And that is picked up right in Hebrews 10, right in Hebrews 8. Paul is not saying because you're Gentiles you don't have to keep the law. It was never meant to be. It was only to get you to look in the mirror as a taskmaster, as a, this is what he uses in Galatians, that you just, to know that you're a sinner. So that's what's happening. In truth, Paul, the most important convert to Christianity, um, he, Paul won. And the doctrines and theology that became the orthodoxy is Pauline, and the Gospels, the storytelling is important, but the doctrines don't come from there. The church adopts Paul, and Paul wins, and his opponents who detested him, their writings don't survive, but we know what they are because Paul spoke about them, and their their enemies spoke about them. They lost. Paul won that, and the enemies lost, and Paul is the most the the only the next I think the second most important convert to Christianity is Constantine, and then you, you know how this whole thing how it went. But they're getting the theology of Paul. Whatever you want, you can get from the New Testament. You want pronomian, antinomian, it's all there because they don't agree with each other. Mm. So you, you just pick up whatever you want. Back in college. A friend of mine who was a Baptist was having a friendly debate with a, a colleague in the AV department or something uh, who was a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, so they were talking about whether you have to keep the Sabbath on Saturday, which, of course, what Sabbath means, the seventh day. Uh, but uh, my friend, the Baptist, quoted this from Colossians. Uh, hey, you, you don't let anybody hassle you about the Sabbaths and so on. And uh, the Adventists said, well, wait a minute. Jesus says whoever uh, disregards the least of these commandments is going to be, uh, you know, the least of the kingdom of heaven. Right. Nobody could ever win that argument because the passages simply right. clash. They don't agree. Right. And so you can take your stand on one or the other, but forget about saying you have a an infallible scripture that's the standard of faith and practice across the board. No. Uh, if you choose one over the other, you become the arbiter, not the scripture. And so that there's something really rotten right. in Denmark there that people never seem to, uh, they'll retreat to saying, well, uh, the one passage, like James versus Paul, do you have to have faith plus mm -hmm. works or, or just faith? Uh, they'll, they'll start retreating into figurative allegorical interpretation. And uh, you can imagine Paul and James up in heaven watching a debate and saying, boy, you know, one or the other, take your pick, is saying, boy, I knew I should have been clearer on that point. Uh, well, they weren't. Yeah. Uh, or maybe they were, and you just insist on obscuring it, uh, which is what's going on. It's just a kind of trickery that ultimately uh, just disillusioned me from the whole uh, enterprise of biblical authority. You have just multiple authors with even mm -hmm. a single book. And then, you know, when, you, when I read Mark, I see Mark as writing over a canvas. I mean, Mark has something else. Orally written, I don't know, but he clearly has something else, a proto-Mark, which didn't survive, and he's comment the the writer is commenting on it like what you mentioned at the end of Mark two like the Sabbath you know was you know was was made for man man for Sabbath that's a commentary of the writer that's clearly an addition so it's so highly developed and people can choose from what they want to advance whatever doctrine they have mm -hmm. and then they have to like you said they have to reinterpret these other texts, the Sermon of the Mount or Colossians 2, and that's really what's going on. You can 
produce any religion you want, and that's why Christianity by far is the most highly variegated religion in the world. That's just what's going on in the New Testament. Uh, to get it all in, they had to leave these aporias, these uh, irresolvable problems. Uh, and they, you can always, uh, Shankara does this with the Upanishads. Everybody has to do it right. to, to get everything in. But the problem with Protestants anyway is that they forswear and reject the idea of, of non-literal interpretation. They say the apparent sense of the text is normative. But then when you say, well, what about this contradiction? They say, oh, that's only an apparent contradiction. When we get to heaven, we'll find, mm. wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought it was the apparent sense that was normative. And you're saying mm. now that it's not, it just rips itself apart. There's no mm. coherent basis of authority anymore in it. The longest council in the history of the Roman Catholic Church is the Council of Trent in the 16th century, which I think spanned from, what, like 1545 to 1563, about there. It was uh, went on for two decades. And I'm not a fan, a fan of Roman Catholicism, but one of the statements that emerged at this anti-reformist council was, you know, if you— Protestants think that you know you're you can reject the Pope, the Bishop of Rome. He says you're just going to wind up having a thousand popes, yeah. and in a way they were right, and because that, that was the one of the arguments they made is if you reject the central authority of Rome, because that's what the Protestant movement is, mm -hmm. it's rejecting the ecumenical authority ex of the Pope, and that's really what it's about. Um, then you're going to have a thousand popes, and they were absolutely correct. Yes, um, they were right. I mean, that's what that they were right on target on that. You're going to have a thousand popes, and that's what they have. Mm -hmm. Protestants and Catholics eviscerated the Holy Roman Empire, all of Germany in the 17th century, mm -hmm. and triggered the Enlightenment. And when we talk about all this scholarship of the 18th and 19th century that began to criticize Christian doctrines. Well, why did it happen then? Why? Well, it happened then because there was a fiercely anti, it was just a different view of religion. Why? Because they were killing each other. That's really what triggered it all. And it led to the point where we are now. So this is a fascinating topic, Bob. Really, really glad we were able to flush some of this out. Maybe we'll meet in Jerusalem one day. Maybe. Adon Olah, Asher Malach, Beterem Kol, Yetzir Nivra, Let Nasa, Bechev Tzokol, Azai Melech, Azai Melech, Shemu Nikra. And 